Today's daf we're going to be learning is Sota Daf Kaftet. Okay, I will warn you, we're getting to two complicated dapim, okay, which have to deal with Tum'an Tahara, laws of impurity, which always gets a little tricky because it's all sorts of things that are new concepts and maybe not new anymore, but still kind of complicated. Um, but we'll only get there in the second part of today's daf. And there's a study guide specifically for the second part, so you can try to use that, it might help. And uh, I also wanted to mention that if you haven't noticed, um, if you use the, the um, Gemara on, on our site, you can click and see the text of the Gemara, which is from Safaria. We've been having a lot of trouble with it for the last week. Something happened, the mechanism failed, and it's been working all this time. So they've been playing around with it, and it's done all sorts of strange things as a result. Um, so right now, all you can see is the English text. So if that's what you have, I'm sorry. But there's a there's a way to bypass it, which is on every there's something called the Safari linker, which means that if you're on if you just are on the title where it says Sota 27, and you click on it, you can get directly to Safari, and it, it should even open up as a pop up on your screen, which means you could follow both at the same time. So that's your workaround right now until we fix it. So just click on the title of today's stuff and you should get the Hebrew and the English and it should be fine. You should get to Safari, which should help you. If you have any issues and you want to know how to work it, please, you can write to us and we will help you. Okay, hopefully it will be resolved in a, in a little while. I was hoping it wasn't going to take a week, but it seems to be taking some time. Okay, with that, we will get started. We ended with, we were in the middle of this bright with Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Akiva. Who we're talking about, if you remember, Rabbi Akiva said, Im nitma, nitma, nitma. Three psukim, one teaches you the woman. Now we're talking about a woman who's accused of being a sota. She's already done the kinoi. He was, she was warned. The stira, she went into the room alone. We have witnesses. And now she's waiting for the sota process, or perhaps he divorces her, or whatever it might be. At this point, she's forbidden to her husband. She can't be with him, have relations with him, even though technically she's still married to him, but they can't have relations. Number two, she's forbidden to the person who she suspected of committing adultery with. So this means if her husband were to die before she ever drank the soda waters, or he divorces her, she can't marry him. And furthermore, she can't eat truma, okay? Which means until she proves her innocence, if she proves her innocence, then she'd go back to eating truma. But until she proves her innocence, if she's married to a Kohen, she can't eat truma anymore, even though they're married, right? And she, normally that would allow her to eat truma. Because maybe she's an adulterer, which would disqualify her for eating truma forever. If she's the daughter of a Kohen, and let's say her husband divorces her instead of bringing her to drink the soda waters, she'll never be allowed to go back to her father's house to eat truma. She can live there, but she can't eat truma. Or if he drops dead before she drinks the soda water. That's the boa. Then, and that's the truma. So we've learned baal, boal, and truma. Now, Rabbi Yishmael says to him, why are you learning this from a pasuk? You could learn it from a kavachomer, but instead of saying why are you learning truma from a pasuk, or why are you learning the baal or the boel, instead he says why are you learning that she can't marry a kohen, which isn't what Rabbi Akiva said. But anyway, Rabbi Yishmael says it's a simple kavachomer to learn that she can't marry a kohen. And, and why didn't you right? And why are you learning it from a pasuk, even though he didn't? So we're gonna have to figure that out. He says, what's the kavachomer? A divorcee, okay, I'm just going through this all so we understand it well before we move on. A divorcee is allowed to eat truma, okay? If you are married to a coin and you are a bat coin, the daughter of a coin, you get divorced, you go back to your father's house and eat truma. Divorce isn't, doesn't disqualify you, like, for example, adultery would disqualify you. So, this doesn't disqualify you, and yet, it does disqualify you from marrying a coin. You can never marry a coin anymore once you're a divorcee. That's basic, says it in the Torah, a Kohen can't marry a divorcee. So it does disqualify for marrying a Kohen, even though it doesn't disqualify from Truma. So this woman who's forbidden to eat Truma, wouldn't it be obvious then that she can't marry a Kohen? Because obviously Kuna is more severe if a divorcee can't marry a Kohen but can't eat Truma. We're going to have a lot of Kavachomers today, so hope you're good with the Kavachomer logic, okay? Um, especially when we get to the Truman Tara stuff. So that's his first question against Rabbi Akiva. To which the Gemara said, well, what are you talking about? Rabbi Akiva didn't even mention kuhuna. Okay, so why are you questioning him and say, why did you learn that from a pasuk? You could have learned it from a kapachomer. And secondly, we ended with this question, le Rabbi Akiva kuhuna manale. Where does he even learn kuhuna? The chitema, and if you want to say that maybe he learns kuhuna, lo kra, maybe you don't even need a pasuk to teach that the sota can't marry a kohen. 
Well, we're going to prove not. Because what would be the logic that Rabbi Akiva could say why it would be obvious that a Sota can't marry a Kohen? It would be maybe because you know, who can't marry a Kohen? Grusha, divorcee. Zona, a prostitute. And Chalala. Okay, we're not going to get into Chalala right now, but a Zona. Now, maybe you'd say a Sota, right? What is she basically? She's a Safek Zona. Maybe she's a Zona. So if you want to say, we know that in Torah law, we're often strict. So this woman, who perhaps is a zona, may, so she would be logical to say she can't marry a coin because she's a suffix zona. Well, if, and that's why you wouldn't need a pasuk. But on that same account, then you wouldn't need a pasuk for truma either because a zona can't eat truma. So, right, that's a disqualification. Again, if I'm a bat coin and I sleep around while I'm married to someone and I sleep with somebody else, I can't go back to, if, even if my husband divorces me, I can't go back to my father's house and eat truma because I was a zona. So, truma nami loti bikrad, then he wouldn't need a pasuk to prove truma on that same tone. So that means if he needs a pasuk for truma, he's going to need a pasuk for kohen also. Because you would say, it doesn't need a pasuk either, shareb a safek zona, kizona, a saba safek zona, kizona, because you made, right, then the safek zona would be considered a zona, both for truma and for kuna, and you wouldn't need a pasuk at all. So basically the question is, so what, if that's the case, we do need a pasuk to learn kuna. So where do we learn kuna from? Where does Rabbi Akiva learn it? So now we're going to, to answer both those questions in one answer, we're going to basically say, it doesn't say these words, but we're going to amend the bright and say the following. Rabbi Akiva arba And it's not a crazy uh, answer because we're going to say the following. Rabbi Akiva has four drasho, not three. One for Baal, Baal, the husband. One for the Boel, the one she slept with or was suspected of sleeping with. One for Truma and one for Kuna. Now, how does he get four? We had Nitma, Im Nitma, Vinitma. That's three psukim. But what did we learn about Rabbi Akiva? Vav includes a fourth. So there you have your three psukim, which really teach you four things because of the extra Vav. Okay, which matches what we've been seeing about Rabbi Akiva all along. So this actually makes a lot of sense. So Arba'a Kraiktiva, there's four psukim really. It's three that become four because of the vav, the end. And that's really what Rabbi Akiva says. And now Rabbi Yishmael's response makes sense. And he says, you don't need a pasuk for the coin because of my kava chomer. And Rabbi Yishmael, why doesn't he have four psukim? Very simply, he doesn't darshan vavim. So Rabbi Akiva tzlata Kraiktiva, there's only three psukim according to him. And where does he learn that she can't marry a Kohen? From a Kavachomer. Once you have Truma, you can get to the Kavachomer and say the Grusha that can eat Truma but can't marry a Kohen teaches you that the Sota, who can't eat Truma, can't, can't marry a Kohen either. So that's what he has. The Kuna is a Kavachomer. Now they say, we could have gone a different way with Rabbi Ishmael. And we're going to ask, why didn't he go this way? Rabbi Yishmael, me mind the Yitzchak the Truma Ukuna Ati Bakavachomer. Why did you go with this track and say third pasuk is Truma, fourth it, right? The fourth issue is learned out from a Kavachomer from Truma. Once you have Truma, you could have said Dilma Ki Yitzchak LeKahuna Utruma Sharia. The Kavachomer proves that Truma is a lighter kind of thing. So why didn't he say we have three pesukim, one for the husband, one for the suspected adulterer, and one for Kahuna? She can't marry a coin. And Truma, Sharia, would be permitted. Maybe she can eat Truma. Why did you go that way and assume she can't eat Truma? If you only have three, maybe drop the Truma one. And since the Kahuna one is in and that's more strict, that's going to be forbidden term. But the lighter thing of Truma, eh, maybe she could eat Truma. Amar Lacha. So he said, if I had to choose, which is the third one I'm going to add in? Is it going to be that she can't marry a coin or is it going to be that she can't eat Truma? Mistabra, again, he's not here to say this, Rabbi Yishmael, but we're assuming, we're putting words in his mouth. Amar l'chawiz means putting words in his mouth. We're assuming he could say. Mistabra dumia dabalu bo'el. If one of them, if we're going to have to choose between she can't eat truma or she can't marry a kohen, we're going to choose the one that's more similar to the fact that she can't marry the husband or the adulterer, the suspected adulterer. So why is, you now we're going to have to say, truma is a more similar issue. Why is that? Ma bal uboel mechayim, af trumanami mechayim. This goes back to the way I described it before. The husband and the suspected adulterer are going to be forbidden to her even when her husband is still alive. Remember, either he can divorce her, 
right? And then she can't marry the one she's suspected of being in a right of doing adultery with. Truma also, he could divorce her and then she can't go back to her father's house and eat Truma, right? Or he's still married to her and he's a Kohen, she can't eat Truma anymore. These are all issues that come up whether the husband's alive or whether the husband's dead. However, la fuke kahuna de la acharmita. Kahuna only happens in one unique case, remember. She can't obviously marry a Kohen when the husband's still alive because either he's still alive and they're married, even though they can't have relations together, they're still married till they finish the Sota process. Of course, she can't marry a Kohen, she's a married woman. If he divorces her, which is the other option he could take and not do the Sota water, well, she can't marry a Kohen because she's a divorcee, not because she's a Sota. So the only way this law could come into effect is if the husband were to die before she drank the Sota waters. First of all, it's already a very unique case because what are the chances that that happens? And number two, it's because probably he'll either divorce her or she'll drink the soda water. And number two, it's not similar really to the Baal or the Boel, which happen even, it's, they, they also happen when he dies, but it, those hap, this happens only when he's dead and all the other three happen even when he's alive. So that's why La Fuke Kuna de La the only way Kuna happens is after death. And that's why if I'm going to choose one, I'm going to choose the Truma, which is more similar to the Baal and the Boel. Now, Rabbi Akiva, we're assuming, didn't go that way. Because if Rabbi Akiva did Baal, remember, Rabbi Akiva does four. Baal, Boel, Truma, Kahuna. In that order. Why in that order? Because if he did Baal, Boel, Kahuna first, then from the fact that she's forbidden to a coin, you can get to Rabbi Ishmael's Kavachomer and say she obviously then can't eat Truma. So, in other words, or not exactly the Kavachomer, but we said, Kahuna is a much stricter thing. If she can't eat, no, I'm sorry, I just said it wrong. You could have said, sorry, if he went the order of Rabbi Ishmael, sorry, my mistake. If he went the order of Rabbi Ishmael and he said, Baal, Boel, Truma, once she was forbidden by Truma, like Rabbi Ishmael said, you can learn Kavachomer de Kuna. So it must be that he didn't go that way. So now the question is, why not? Why wouldn't he say? Truma is the more obvious one because it's more similar to the Baal and the Boel. Oh, Rabbi Akiva, do me a Baal or Boel lately. He doesn't think that that's a consideration. When you have three different psukim and each one comes to teach one thing, each one could teach random things. They don't have to be similar in any way to each other. So he doesn't hold by that, which meant that he basically went like this. Husband, adulterer, she can't marry a Kohen. You might still have thought she could eat Truma because Truma's lighter than all that. Well, then he added the fourth, Drasha added in the Truma. That's one way to read Rabbi Akiva. Inami itle, alternatively, you could say he does hold by the similarity is a, is a factor. And then what do you do? You say husband, adulterer, truma is forbidden. You theoretically could have learned a kavachomer to kahuna, but there's a fourth pasuk anyway to teach kahuna. Why? Well, milta de'ati b'kavachomer tarach b'katev lakra. Sometimes the pasuk has a drasha on something that you could have learned from a kavachomer. So theoretically, maybe he does agree with Rabbi Ishmael that it goes in that order and that the, the truma would come first because it's more similar to the Baal and the Boa because all those can happen when the husband's still alive and would be relevant, which the coin is not a relevant factor unless he dies. And then the fourth one came to include this issue that could have been learned from a Kabbalah, but we're learning it anyway from a Drasha because sometimes the Pasuk just does that anyway. So that was an explanation of the Machlok at Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Kiva. And with Rabbi Kiva, we ended up with two possible ways of how to read it. Okay, in the end, it's it's all the same. He learns it out from four psukim, but perhaps he also learns the fourth one from a kavachom. Now we're moving on to another issue that Rabbi Yishmael talked about. Rabbi Yishmael talked about that we're going to learn laws of suffix, doubts when it comes to impurity, by from learning it out from sota. And what did we learn? Just like sota happens only in the private domain, any suffix of impurity, a doubt about impurity, is going to be we're going to be strict about it, like a sota, we're strict with her. Right? And forbid her to her husband, the tame item that we're not sure is it really impure or not will be treated as tame. Number one, if the doubt came about in a, a, a private area, not a public space. And if there's someone there who could have known whether it was a tama about a person, maybe the person became tame. So again, someone theoretically could have known because there was a person involved. Or there was a person in the room when the sherets fell on wherever it fell and we're just not sure where it fell. Now, obviously, remember, this means the person isn't, we can't ask the person for whatever reason, they're not, they, they're not, they, they went abroad, they're not here, or they just don't know, but they theoretically could have known. So only in that kind of situation are we going to be strict about impurity. 
So now Rav Gidl, in the name of Rav, is going to quote a different way of learning this second halacha, not about the private domain, but the one about Yesh Bodat Yishael. So I'm Rav Gidl Amara. Tavar Sheyesh Bodat Yishael, Ve'em Bodat Yishael, Mehai Kranafka. This differentiation between whether there's a human involved or not a human involved is learned out from a different pasuk. V'habasar asher yiga b'chol tamei lo yeachel. This is sacrificial meat which touches something tamei will not be eaten. Now, let's derive something from that. It will not be eaten if it's tamei, which sounds like definitively tamei. Vaday tamei hu de lo yeachel. It can't be eaten if it's tamei. Tamei means we know it's tamei. Which would imply ha safek tamei safek tahor yeachel. It could be eaten if we're not sure about its status. That's what it sounds like. A masefa, but the end of that pasuk seems to imply the opposite, which is, right, this is saying suffolk we're going to be lenient with. The next part of that pasuk says, v'habasal, when it comes to eating meat, kol tahol, we're talking about humans, any person who is pure, yochal basar, can eat sacrificial meat. Now, what does it sound like? In order to eat sacrificial meat, you have to be tahol, which means vaday tahor hu yochal basal. You can eat the meat if you're definitely pure. Hasafek tamei safek tor. What if you're in doubt? Lo yet lo yocha. You can't eat. Notice, right? The first part of the pasuk talks about what can't be done, and the second part of the pasuk talks about what can be done. So therefore, we're implying the opposite from each part. The first part seems to imply safek is okay. Second part seems to imply only if you're definitely tahor can you eat, but if you're not sure, you can't eat. So el alav shmami. Now, how can we resolve this difference? Well, el alav shmami now. What's the difference between the first part and the second part? The first part was talking about the meat. The second part was talking about the person. Meat that's impure, that's in bodad lishael. That's why we're going to be lenient about its law. Because, it, right, it, there's no human involved. So therefore, we're going to be lenient about it. When it comes to yes bodad lishael, the human, because you can ask, again, they might not know, but you can add, right, there's Theoretically, there's possibility for them to know. There, we're going to be strict and say the suffix we're not going to allow to eat. So that teaches us the same law. So now we have the obvious question. They don't ask the question. They just give the answer, which is why do you need both drashot? Would have been enough to learn from one or the other. Well, it's drich drav gidol amarav, it's drich l'migmar misota. We need them both. Why? To imi rav. Now, if it's from rav and we're learning suffix tuma from rav, that it all depends on is it human? Is there human intervention or not? Well, it would sound like the private public domain is a non-factor. So, therefore, you can't learn it just from there because you would only learn one criteria. You wouldn't learn the second criteria. Well, then obviously, well, Sota teaches you both, so it's obviously better. So why would you need it, right? And that's why it's Rikhli Migmarmi Sota, which teaches you also the private domain. So now the obvious question, well, E mi so why don't you just learn it from Sota? You can learn both criteria. Why do you need it? Well, Sota is unique. Because why? There's two people. There's the man that causes the woman to be defiled, and there's the woman herself who becomes defiled. Both are humans. So you might have thought that in order to say Suffolk Tuma would be a problem, you would have to have both humans. Okay? Like a person who's Matame, another person. And only in that case would we have an issue? Like a tame mate, for example. Can, if a tame mate touches someone else, they make them impure. So maybe only that case would be a case, where, right, if you learned it from Sota. So that's why you need the other case to say, no, 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 you just need one human involved, and that already makes it reason for doubt. Okay, then we're going to be strict with a case of doubt. Okay, so what we did so far is we explained, and I won't go back to this at the end of the daft because we're already going to be on a totally different topic. I'll summarize right now what we did so far. We have the Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Yishmael debate, and it wasn't clear in the bright to what was going on because Rabbi Yishmael was answering Rabbi Akiva from something Rabbi Akiva didn't actually say. So we end up explaining very simply there was something missing there. Really, Rabbi Akiva darshan four things. Also, the Kaluna was one of them. And then we tried to explain, right, Rabbi Akiva didn't darshan all four because he doesn't darshan buffs. So he only had three. The fourth came from a Kava Homer. Why did Rabbi Akiva learn the fourth from a Kava Homer? So we said either maybe he did, and there was just a pasuk that added what could be learned from a couple of or he learned it first, the other one, right? First, the the tru, the kahuna, and only after that, the truma, and that's why he couldn't get to a couple of Then we brought this thing about Rav Gidl, in the name of Rav, who basically brings a different pasuk, an alternative pasuk, 
for the Davar Sheyesh Bodali Sha'el, and then we explain why you need both. Okay, why you need to learn from both places. Now we're going back to the Mishnah. If you remember, the Mishnah started off with Rabbi Akiva, who says, okay, the second case in our Mishnah was, Bo Bayom Darash Rabbi Akiva Klicheres, Asher Yipom Mitocho, Asher Yipom El Tocho, Kol Asher Betocho Yitma, if, sorry, I didn't read the whole pasuk, Klicheres, where a Sheretz falls into the airspace of the Klicheres, already, right, the entire vessel is impure. And not only that, right, what does he say? But it says yitma. Yitma means if there's something in that vessel which becomes a sheni, because again, the sheretz is a rishon. This is very important to understand all these stages. Sorry, the sheretz is an avatuma. I just said that wrong. Sheretz is an avatuma. Avatuma creates that the kli will be a rishon. The kli then can be matame only food to be a sheni. So that's what's in the kli, yitma. That's what the Pasuk says. Comes Rabbi Akiva and says, Yitma is written as Yitma because you can read it as Yitame. That Shani can go on and pass on Tumah to a Shlishi even when it comes to Chulin. Comes Rabbi Yoshua and says, Oh wow, too bad Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai is not here anymore. Because he was worried that what? That in future generations, people are going to say there's no Pasuk for a Shlishi in the Torah and they're going to permit Shlishi. They're going to say there is no such thing as a Shlishi. And now we have a Pasuk, we have a source for it. Now it gets a little bit tricky because Rabbi Akiva was saying that the the Shani can make a shlishi. Okay, one second, I just want to see something. Okay, a sh- um, right. Okay, a Shani can make a shlishi when it comes to only truma or sacrificial meat, but Rabbi Akiva has this opinion it can even make chulin. But when Ramban Yochanan ben Zakkai is worried that people are going to be able to hear the Shlishi, he means Truma, really. And the whole discussion we're going to have about Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai here is really only talking about a Shlishi and Truma. And now what Rabbi Akiva was talking about, even in Chulin, even in non-sacred stuff. Okay? That's just a, a distinction we're going to put aside. Rabbi Akiva was talking about it can even make a Shlishi when it comes to sacred, non-sacred items. But when Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai is worried that people are going to come along, they're going to say there's no Pasuk for Shlishi anywhere, so therefore, people are going to come and say, there's no such thing as shlishi by truma. Okay, so again, I'm going to explain to you very clearly what happens. Sheretz, or a person, right, who's tamei avatuma, touches, can touch a vessel or a person or food, make them into a rishon. That rishon can only be tamei food, to be a sheni. In the case of truma, which is what the kohani meat, or sacrificial meat or meal offerings or things like that, the truma, right, so again, you can have food that's a sheni will pass on impurity to a shlishi, and shlishi can pass on impurity to a revi'i only if it's kachim. So kachim is the highest level, sacrificial stuff. Truma is right below that, okay? So that's what we're going to talk about. So now comes the Gemara, and the Gemara says, okay, we're now going back to Kaftet. So first they just quote, Boba Yom Darash Rabbi Akiva Kol But now we're really questioning Rabbi Yochanan Ben Zakkai. And they say the following, Me'achar de'en lo, if you don't have a pasuk, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, then why are you so concerned about this people being mitahel shlishi and saying there's no such thing as shlishi when it comes to truma? There's no pasuk, so how serious could it be? And where do you even get this, that there's a shlishi? To which he says, Amal of Yudah Marav, here starts the complicated part of today's stuff. I'm going to share screen with the, with the study guide so you can follow along. Okay, this will help. So our first chart. Rabbi Yehuda says in the name of Rav, I told you we're going to have a lot of kavachomers today. Same thing as Rabbi Ishmael. He says, right, we don't have a pasuk, but we do have a kavachomer. So here also we have a kavachomer. What's a tful yom? A tful yom is someone who either was tame for one day or could be tame for seven days. On the seventh day or on the, first, or on the day they become tame, depending on what type of impurity you have, you go to the mikvah in the morning usually. The rest of that day, you're in the status of a tful yom. We're going to see all sorts of things about a tful yom today. The first thing to know is that a tful yom is allowed to eat chulin. Okay, there's no problem with that. That's obvious. And doesn't mess up. Okay, he can eat chulin. But he's posel betruma. Okay, which means, number one, he still has, he's, he was impure before he went to the mikvah. He only becomes fully pure when the night comes, okay, this was the very first mission in, in Shas, which is, right, when can you re, uh, reach my at night? 
when the Kohanim nechnesim l'achol b'tchumatam, when can they eat their truma? Once it gets dark out, because until that point they can't eat truma, and they actually disqualify truma. So, says the following, the Kav Chomet, a tful yom, who's permitted to eat chulin, and yet is posel b'tchuma, right, can't eat truma, ki karsheni she pasul b'chulin, ain odin she aseh shlishi b'tchuma. You have to kind of live with the fact that we're making a little bit of a strange comparison, because we're comparing a person who's in a certain level of impurity, to an object, a kikarsheni, a, a loaf, okay, which is, now, to say a tful yom is allowed to eat chulin is not the same as saying a kikarsheni is possible chulin. What does that mean? Well, something that became impure, a second degree impurity, is disqualified even if it's chulin, right? Meaning a loaf that went into an oven where a sheretz had been in, Right? The loaf becomes second degree impurity because the, the vessel is the oven is first degree impurity, right? Which came from the avatuma, which was the sheretz. So a kikar sheni, we're going to say now, is more severe than a tful yom because a tful yom is, again, these, this much of a chulin, present of are not exactly comparable terms, but they both relate to chulin. A tful yom can be chulin. A kikar sheni is disqualified if it's chulin. Okay, again, chulin is just non sacred. So, a no din. So, if you accept, okay, you have to just accept this that this shows that full yom is lighter because of the chulin, right? It's, it's got no effect on chulin. Well, in that case, since the tful yom disqualifies truma, if I'm a tful yom and I touch truma, I disqualify that I can't eat truma if I'm a tful yom. Well, ki karsheni, shapasa vachulin, a no din, shiaseshli shibatuma. So, shouldn't also the ki karsheni pass on impurity to truma. So that's his kavachomer. Now comes the Gemara and starts questioning his kavachomer. You can knock out a kavachomer, basically, by saying this, you know, we thought the tful yom is lighter because of the chulin issue. But maybe there's something strict about a tful yom, which is what causes it to have the ability to, not right, the tful yom, for example, can't eat truma. Let's talk about well, maybe because of that, they're possible truma, possible truma, but not, right, because of their sad chamul, because they're not as, it's not, it's light in one way, but it's strict in a different way, and maybe that's, that strictness, severity, is what causes our halacha, which means you can't learn a kavachomer anymore, because unless the kikarsheni has that same stringency, which it's not going to have, well then, you could say, that stringency causes it to be disqualified in truma, to disqualify truma. So, let's try to see what that is. Ikel mifrach. You can knock out this kavachomer and say the following. Ma l'tful yom shekein avatuma. A tful yom can actually be an avatuma. What does that mean? If I come in contact with a dead body, okay, and then I become impure for seven days. Once I'm impure for seven days, what happens? I go to the mikvah on the seventh day, and then I'm a tful yom. So there's cases of a tful yom where I myself could be an avatuma, okay? Because a dead body is aviavotatuma. It's like a much higher level even than a sheretz, right? A sheretz is an avatuma. If I come in contact with a dead body, I am myself called an avatuma. So a tful yom is a chumrah because I can even be an, a tful yom could potentially have been an avatuma themselves. Now, you'll see in a minute, they're not saying because it's an avatuma and a kikar sheni is only a sheni and it's a lower level, they're saying Avatuma is in a totally different category from Rishon, Shani, and all those other because they're more indirect, right? It's already come in contact with something they came in contact with. But an Avatuma itself is, a, is, a, is serious. So because a Fuyom is an Avatuma in some cases, that makes it very strict. Maybe that's why a Fuyom can't have Truma, okay? And then that would be a different reason that wouldn't affect the Kikar Shani, which means, right, you can't learn from there to a second degree impurity, which is totally different and, and much lighter in that sense. So maybe you wouldn't learn that it's possible true. So they say, returning now to Amubet, okay, you're worried about a tful yom that can be an avatuma? Well, there's all sorts of tful yom. So take to me tful yom to share it. So just uh, amend the kava, the kava homer and say what he meant when he said tful yom. You don't even have to change it. You just say, he meant tful yom of a share meaning... Someone who was a human came in contact with a creepy crawly creature, one of the Shretzim, and then became impure. That would be a Rishon. Rishon Shani already, that's similar. That's not, doesn't have this strictness of a, of a, 
of an avatum. But they say no. You could still say that that has a tzad chamu, a strict tzad, because what? Malat full yom de sheretz, even if you say it full yom of sheretz, shekem bimino avatum. Now it's true that full yom of sheretz can never be an avatum, but full yom as a category could relate to things that are avatumas. It could be you're a human who's an avatuma. So even though full yom of sheretz is not so severe, but since in that category of full yom there is a strict case, you could say maybe that's what causes a tful yom to have this strict thing that's possible truma, which then you couldn't apply to this kikar sheni. All along, we're going this back and forth to try to figure out is there a, what we call a tzad chamul in the, which would then ruin our kavachomer in the tful yom. So then they say, well, chli cheres yochiach. Okay, an earthenware vessel could prove it. Why? An earthenware vessel doesn't have mimino avatuma. Okay, and yet it can pass on impurity to a shlishi. Okay, so now we're going to say, or it can, or it can actually forget that it can passle truma, right? If I have a kli, uh, a vessel that's a rishon, okay, a kli cheres, and I have a loaf of bread in there that's truma, that will ruin it. So you now have two things: you have tful yom and you have a kli cheres, which disqualifies truma. So from there, you can learn to this Kikar Shani. So now they're going to say, but no. Because cause then, what does this prove, basically? Since the stringency that we had in the Tful Yom, this is a classic argumentation of a Kavachom. Since the stringency we had in the Tful Yom, which was that it could potentially be an Avatum, even if it's not, doesn't exist in a Klicheres, because a Klicheres can never be an Avatum, because there's no such thing, right? If a kli cheres comes in with a dead body, it's a rishon. It's not an avatuma. Okay, you can't have a kli cheres avatuma. So, mala kli cheres shaken. So, that, so now we're going to say that proves that the severity of being able to have a type of the tfulyom could be an avatuma doesn't exist in something else that would be the same as it. So that would prove that it's not the stringency of it could be an avatuma that causes it to pass off truma, in which case you bring your kavachomer back. But, because the whole thing was maybe that's the stringency that causes it, and that doesn't exist in kikar sheni, but it also doesn't exist in klicheres, and klicheres does disqualify truma, which means that you can learn kikar sheni from both of them. But then they say, ma the klicheres, she came into me but klicheres has its own stringency. So then you could say, the the um, tful yom has a stringency that it has a, it could be an avatuma. The kli has a stringency that it's you can be matame. The sheretz is matame just from coming into the airspace of it without actually touching it. That's a unique halacha by a, by an earthenware vessel that just by coming into the airspace of this kli you can actually be matame the entire kli even without touching it. So it has its own stringency. To which they say, okay, well, that doesn't prove anything because tful yom yochiach, because, right? <laughs> then you could say, look, this has a stringency and this has a stringency, but since this is not the same stringency as that, it's obviously not that stringency that's proving it, and it's not that stringency that's proving it be- that that causes the truma, which means you could learn a kavachomer from both of them, really. To which they say the chose radin, though, but no, lo rizekirizeh, lo rizekirizeh. This one doesn't look like that one. That one doesn't look like that one. But they do have a tzara shavesh They have the least common denominator between them. What is that? Shehen mutarim bechulin uposlim betruma. Okay, this line is incredibly complicated and all the commentaries say something's wrong here. Because what do you mean they're mutarim bechulin? They're not mutarim bechulin. A kli is, is pasul bechulin. It's tame in chulin. So what, this doesn't make any sense. Rashi changes it, although we're going to see it's also complicated to understand this line, even with Rashi's emendation. A whole bunch of Rishonim change it in all different ways because it really makes no sense. And now we're stuck because we don't really know what the least common denominator is between these, but we're going to say the following. Let's go with Rashi. The least common denominator is that both of these things in the Torah are called Tameh. Okay? They're called Tameh, and they pass on impurity also to Truma. They're post limit Truma. So therefore, koshikain ki karsheni shaposa b'chulin de posa b'truma. Okay, so now back to our chart. So now let's pull up the chart for a minute. We now go back and say, so we're going to change the chart a little. I didn't change this because I, it's hard to do things three-dimensional in charts. But at this point, we're going to say, 
The Kava Chomer is the Tvul Yom and the Kli Cheres. And what's, now, it's tricky. What's unique about them both? They're Tmei'im. Okay, now, we were looking for something that was a Kula. That's a bit of a problem here. We were looking, originally, it was, it's Mutra B'chulin versus the Kikar Sheni, which is Pasu B'chulin, right? Because it's full Yom can, can, can eat Chulin, whereas the Kikar Sheni is disqualified if it's Chulin, right? That's any, right, Chulin item that came in contact with the Rishon is going to be disqualified. So now they say the following. So let's just read it again. So the two of them, mutarim b'chulin and poslin b'truma. Again, we have to change mutarim b'chulin to tamein. They're both called tamein the Torah. Now, maybe what it means here is tamein usually means it itself is impure, but not that it passes on impurity. And yet they pass on impurity to truma. So kol shekein, here's the tricky part. Why is it a kol shekein? when it's really almost like they're equivalent and not exactly in a way of Kavah Chomer, but I'm going to leave that as a question. Okay? So from there, we conclude our Kavah Chomer from the two of them together, the Tful Yom and the Kli Cheres, we're going to learn that since they are disqualified for Truma, Ki Karsheni also can pass on impurity to Truma. Okay? A Sheni passes on impurity to a Shlishi, even though this is quite a complicated Kav to understand, and, and again, not just it's hard to follow, but it, the conclusion isn't 100% really sounding like a Kav Like I said, there's a lot of problems with the Gersa, which is why everyone's kind of struggling with this topic, but we're going to leave it at that. That's his Kav Now the question is, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai, basically what happened? He told us, you know, I'm worried that some future generation is going to come and say that I, you know, and, and change this law and say that a kikar sheni can't pass on impurity to a shlishi. To which, right, we basically, all we did so far in this section is say, so where did he get it from? If he didn't have a, a source in the Pasuk, where did he get it from? It must be this kapachomer, and it took us a while to understand this kapachomer, and even now we're still a little confused by it. Now they want to come and explain, well, what was he worried about that people were going to come and say? So that's the next part. Now they say, Vidor Acher Parich, what will the next generation question, right, and, and knock out this Kava Chomer? Well, exactly what we just said, right? Malat Sada Shaveh Shavehen. In other words, they'll say, what do you mean the least common denominator? Shekin Yesh Ben Tzad Chamor. Both the Tvul Yom has its own stringency, the Kli Cheres has its own stringency, and they could say, maybe it's true, that's not the same stringency as that, but maybe each of those stringencies independently is what causes the Dean about the Truma in those which then can't be applied to the Kikar Sheni, which doesn't have those stringencies at all. So that's what they, that's what he was worried people were going to come and complain about, you know, and knock out his Kavah Chomer, in which case, since there's no sorts in the Torah, he'd be stuck, right? They'd, they'd get rid of this Halacha entirely. And Rabban Yochanan and Zakai, why was he not concerned about that himself? Like, why did he not think that? What's the Chamor lo par? He, he goes by this least common denominator. He's okay. He doesn't think if this one has a Tzad Chamor and this one has a Tzad Chamor, that knocks it out. As long as they have this least common denominator between them, which is not such a stringency, then we can learn from there to something else. Okay, that was part one of this section. Okay, so just to do a quick review, we had this Braita, right? I'm sorry, we had this, um, this Rabban Yochanan and Zakai in the Mishnah, who said, I'm worried what's going to happen. They said, where did you even get this from? That Shani passes on the Shlishi, if not from the Torah? Answer is Kavah You have to figure out exactly what that Kavah is. I would say it kind of ends with not exactly Kavah but more like this is, they're both very similar. So let's learn from here to there, more like maybe a Binyanav. It's more a little bit like a paradigm, at least the way Rashi understands it. And then we say the other ones would knock it out and say, no, 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 right? What he was worried about is they would come and say, each one has a stringency in the first category, the Tful Yom and the Kli Cheres. From there, you couldn't necessarily learn to a regular Shaney, which could pass on impurity to Truman and disqualify it. Okay. That was all about Shaney passing on impurity to a Shlishi if it's Truma. Okay, that was the topic. Now, since we're already on this topic, they bring up another question, which is a Braita where Rabbi Yossi says, Tanya, I'm Rabbi Yossi. Now we're going to have the exact same kind of structure here, which is Rabbi Yossi is going to say, Minayan Lirevi Bakodesh. How do you know that when it comes to a shlishi, it can pass on impurity to a revi, to a fourth degree impurity, if it's sacrificial meat, sacrificial wine, sacrificial meal offering, right? Whatever is on this level of what we call koche kochim, how do you know that there's revi bakodesh, shepasu? Okay? Vidinu. 
So again, he's going to say a kava chomer. It's going to be very similar. Ma mechusar kipurim. Okay, we're going to have, and here's the next chart on the page. What's a mechusar kipurim? That's someone like a zav, a zava, yoleda, mitzora, all these kind of people that have a seven-day process. They finish it. They go to the mikvah on day seven. By the time the sun sets that night, they're good, right? What do we mean? That means they can eat shruma. That's what we saw about the koanim. They can eat shruma that night. They're not impure anymore. However, they're missing one element, which is the next day they're supposed to bring a sacrifice. As long as they haven't brought a sacrifice, they can't eat sacrificial meat. So in the same way the Tzul Yom couldn't eat truma in the morning after they went to the mikvah, the Mechusar Kippurim, after he goes to the mikvah and the sun sets that day, he still can't eat sacrificial meat. He, brings a, he or she brings a korban. That sacrifice permits them to eat sacrificial meat again. Okay? So now, that's just a basic law of a Mechusar Kippurim. So here comes our Kav HaChomer. Ma Mechusar Kippurim Shemutar B'Tchuma now they can eat truma, remember I just said that, and yet they're puzzled with Kodesh, they can't eat sacrificial meat or sacrificial items. Shlishi, so a shlishi, which is puzzled with truma, again, this is just like we said, the kikar sheni was puzzled with because that, that is what it is. A shlishi disqualifies truma, meaning a shlishi itself is, if it's truma, it's disqualified. Ain't no din, she has to So since the Mechusar Kippurim is permitted in Truma, and yet is posa b'kodesh. Shlishi, which is, can't, right, it's a problem if it's Truma, all the more so should be able to pass on impurity to a Revi. So that's a Kav HaChomer. So now they say, V'lamanu shlishi l'kodesh min Torah, u'revi mi Kav HaChomer. And now Rabbi Yossi continues and makes another statement, which we'll have to explain in a second, which is, Shlishi for sacrificial meat, we actually learn from a Pasuk. The Ravi, the fact they passed on impurity, we learned from this Kav HaChomer that I just said. So Shlishi, the Kodesh Men of Torah Minai, where do we get a Pasuk that talks about a Shlishi? Dichtiv, as it says, Habasar Ashir Yiga B'chol Tamei Lo Yachel. We just quoted this Pasuk earlier in today's Da'at. Right? The meat which touches any Tamei can't be eaten. Mi Lo Askin and Dinaga B'Shini. Right? It says meat that touches any Tamei. Any Tamei should include what levels of Tamei do we have in the Torah? Rishon Shani. So, wouldn't it be mentioning even if it touches a sheni, which So what do you see here? You can't eat a shlishi when it comes to meat. Because meat that touches something that's tamay, which presumably was a sheni, or included even a sheni, is impure. So there we have the shlishi and the ravi mikav chomer, kedamaran, as we already said. Now Rabbi Yochanan is going to come and question Rabbi Yossi. And we're toward the end of our daf now, last line of argumentation. He wants to go back to, you know, to the previous chart and say, wait, this Kavachomer that Rabbi Yossi said could be knocked out from a different case. Tam b'ribi eni yodama. Okay, b'ribi is his way of talking about Rabbi Yossi. The reasoning, he says, I don't get. Sha'arei tshuva tov tzido. A tshuva is usually an answer, but in the Gemara, it's also a question. Tshuva comes to the word lahashiv, a response. A response could be a response of a question. So here's my question. Ochel haba machmat tvul yom yochiach. Food, okay, now. We're going to learn a new thing. There's a three-way machloket about a tful yom. The rabbis basically were strict with a tful yom and said that a tful yom carries impurity also. They can cause things to become impure even once they've gone to the mikvah until the sun is set. And there's a three-way machloket. And we're now going to say Rabbi Yochanan's kushia is based on the third opinion, the rabbi's opinion in this machloket. Okay, there's Abishal, Rabbi Meir, Chachamim. We're going to learn their opinions and then we'll end with this question. So he says the following. Tvul yom yochiach, she pasul b'truma, ve'eno se revi b'kodesh. A tvul yom disqualifies truma, but can't, whatever he disqualifies its truma, which is a slishi, it doesn't go any farther than that. He can't turn something into revi in kodesh. So, that would then prove that this whole kavachomer is off, because you could say a shlishi b'truma is pasul b'truma, but doesn't pass on to revi, just like food that comes in contact with a tvul yom. So we're going to see this now inside. Ditanya, Abishaul Omer. Like I said, forget opinion one and two right now. I mean, we're going to learn it. And it's important to learn because we're going to continue with it in the Gemara. But right now, what we're focusing on for our question is opinion number three. Tvul yom, t'chila l'kodesh, l'tameh shnayim v'lifso l'chad. A tvul yom is, okay, what, say it's called a t'chila l'kodesh, which means what? It's a, it's, it can start off in purity, which means what? It's a rishon. Okay, a tvul yom is like a rishon, which means what? Litame shnayim, he can be mitame a sheni. Okay, in other words, a tvul yom touches food, turns it into a sheni. 
And that Shani can turn, right? It's Latame. It passes on impurity twice to a Truma, okay, to a Shlishi. And Lifsolachad, and it can disqualify a Ravi. So basically, if I'm a Tvul Yom and I touch food, which touches Truma, which touches Kodshim, all of those are going to be impure. Chachamim, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Um, the Rabbi Meir Omer, Metameh Chadu Posel Echad. Rabbi Meir says, wait, the rabbis only had to go two levels because the rabbis considered it full yom uh, sheni, which means that they can only make a shlishi impure if it's truma or kachin, and that will make a ravi. So it goes two levels, but it starts from sheni, goes to shlishi ravi. But chachamim amrim, kashem shaposel ochle truma, mashke truma, this is what we were looking for, just like it could disqualify food of truma and drinks of truma, kach posel ochle kodesh umashke kodesh. It can disqualify Kodshim, okay, by touching it, meaning it can be a shani, it can mess up truma and kodshim, but it can't pass on impurity to a ravii. It can only go one level of shlishi. Can't go to ravii. So that's what Rabbi Yochanan says. Look, I can use this case of food that comes from a tful yom, according to the rabbi's opinion, that when they establish that a that tful yom is going to pass on impurity, they pass it on only one level. They're a shani, they pass on to a shlishi, even if that food came in contact with sacrificial meat, it won't do anything to it. So here you see an example where something disqualifies truma but doesn't pass on to become a ravi. So likewise, you could say the same thing with the shlishi. Maybe there is no such thing as ravi but kodesh. So Matkif Lara Papa, and we'll end with his question. You can just very simply say, why is Rabbi Yochanan questioning Rabbi Yossi from the rabbi's opinion? Why don't you just say, because remember, we had Abishawal and even Rabbi Meir, who said that a Tful Yom could pass on impurity to Ravi. So, Rabbi Yochanan, you're asking a question from the rabbis. You could say Rabbi Yossi just holds like Abishawal, or maybe even Rabbi Meir. The Gemara is asking specifically about Abishawal. So, tomorrow, I'm going to stop right here and leave it for tomorrow. Why the Gemara is going to say, if he held like Abishawal, then he would have said something else. Okay, and we'll get to that tomorrow because this is already a lot for today. And from here, we're going to end. So again, what we did in this last section, which again, I admit, was a complicated section, um, but the structure of it is actually quite clear, which is, first, we tried to figure out on what basis did Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai say, if it's no Pesach in the Torah, on what basis does he say that a Shani passes on to a Shlishi when it comes to Truma? And then we said, on what basis was he worried that people were going to disagree with him? And we came up with this Pabachoma that we had to prove. It took a little while to really clarify it fully. Then, once we said, where's the source for a shlishi, then we got to where's the source for a ravi when it comes to sacrificial meat. From that, we brought Rabbi Yossi's Kabachomer, and then we said shlishi comes from a pasuk, ravi comes from this Kabachomer. Rabbi Yochanan questioned the Kabachomer based on the opinion of the rabbis, and we were left with the question of saying, well, why did Rabbi, what, Rabbi Yossi could just say, I don't hold by the rabbis, I hold by Abishal, where there is a ravi. Okay, that was the structure of what we did. Again, a bit complicated. If you review the daf, you'll see it's, it, it gets easier as you look at it a second time. And if not, nah, then that's okay too. And we'll move on tomorrow and continue where we left off and then continue in this about the Rishon Shein, Yishli, Shiri, all that. Have a great day, everybody.